Good evening, everyone. It's on or about 6.30, so I'll call this meeting to order, and in so doing, ask everyone to please silence uh, cell phones or other electronic devices. Our first motion is moved by Councillor Bateman and seconded by Councillor Anderson. The Council amend the December 16th Council meeting to remove item 12.3 and 12.4 from the agenda. Uh, Councillor Bateman, why would we be removing these? The, <clears throat> Mr. Miller asked for them to be removed. Mr. Miller? I did. Uh, at the last minute, the insurance company is questioning, uh, has a couple of questions on, on them because uh, they're not our properties. Understood. We don't own them, so they will hopefully be back next month. Thank you. Any, uh, any further discussion on that? All those in favor? Are there any opposed? Motion is carried. And I have a motion moved by Deputy Mayor Vink, seconded by Councillor Tadman, that Council amend the agenda to add correspondence from Dennis Fletcher regarding the Hops Kiln to be re relocated. Correspondence under 5.3 of the agenda. Pardon me, 15.3 of the agenda. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? The motion's carried. And I have a motion moved by Deputy Mayor Vink, seconded by Councillor Anderson, that Council approve the December 16th, 2019 Council agenda as amended. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? The motion's carried. And with that, I'll ask if there are any declarations of pecuniary interest, and if so, please state the general nature thereof. Deputy, uh, pardon me, Councillor Bateman. Uh, just on the, I want to, I didn't get in there on the minutes. I just want a clarification. I know we dropped 12.3, but 9.3 and 12.3, one referred to that property as 3 Elizabeth Street, and the other is 6 Elizabeth Street. Just for clarification, is it 3 or 6? It's, it's 3 Elizabeth Street. And we should remove 9.3 from the agenda as well. Um, but we'll do that when we get there now. So again, I'll ask for declarations of pecuniary interest and in the general nature thereof. There are none noted. Are there any announcements? Councillor Tadman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the first thing I wanted to, to let everyone know that I was honored again to be asked to fill in to go to the Elevate Plus graduation in Trenton, and I recommend it to all councillors and the Mayor. Uh, what goes on there is a six-week free course for people that, you know, have kind of got lost in their workforce or had problems and whatever. And they, uh, there's a partnership between the Bay Quinney Economic Development, the Loyalist College, and uh, Employment Ontario. They partner together and there's uh, manufacturing and agricultural businesses that actually guarantee that they will hire them when they get their certificate at the end. And these people have had some really hard knocks in life, and it's 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 such a good feeling to see that they've been through the program, they've been hired, and they're so happy that they now can get on with their life. So that, I think, um, I hope that I'll be able to go again next year, because I've enjoyed it both years that I went. The other thing that I wanted to let everyone know that, and, and the mayor was there for, I don't know how long, but anyway, the mayor was there also, the Hilton... Um, put on a concert yesterday in honor of Florence Chatton, which probably everybody here knows. Uh, it's no secret that she's 96 years old. She um, has been just an amazing volunteer. She's written books. She's done all kinds of things. She has participated with groups in music. She's played a piano since she was a little girl. She now finds, because of her eyesight, that she's moving into seasons in a couple of days. So she donated her piano to the Hilton Hall, and she played uh, 
with the accompaniment of Sharon and Ian Graham, two songs, and everybody gave her a standing ovation. And the one thing she said before she started to play, she said, the piano, which I've played all my life, is 104 years old. I'm not. <laughs> She's 96. So um, uh, uh, hopefully uh, everybody if they bump into her and wish her the best at seasons and she's very nervous about going there because this has been her life here but um, we hope for the best for her. Thank you Councillor Tadman. Any other announcements? I would uh, just like to let everyone know that uh, Mr. <coughs> Parkinson sent out an email to uh, uh, through Mr. Castleman uh, to me this morning uh, advising that we have received our ECA from the province for the MBBR system. So that process continues to move forward, that important process continues to move forward here in Brighton and uh, we will be uh, applying for the Green Fund and our MPP is here tonight but he also knows that I will be pitching yet again <coughs> for more money from the province and our federal friends. So. That's, those are the announcements. And I move on to the adoption of minutes. Moved by Deputy Mayor Vink, seconded by Councillor Anderson. That Council approve the December 2nd, 2019 Council meeting minutes as presented. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? The motion's carried. Moved by Councillor Tadman, seconded by Councillor Rowley. The Council approve the December 9th, 2019 planning meeting minutes as presented. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? The motion's carried. We have no statutory public meeting this evening, so we move straight into delegations. And our first delegation is the aforementioned MPP Puccini. Mr. Puccini, if you'll please join us. Right up here. Come on up. If you, yeah, there you go. Well, thank you very much, Your Worship, and uh, Brighton Council for receiving me this evening. It's uh, great to be here, and uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to present to Council about a number of uh, initiatives at the provincial level, and of course to answer any questions you might have on on any any matters of concern that affect the province. Um, I'll start off uh, just by by um, by touching on our modernizing municipalities funding. Um, so I'll, d I'll dive right into it, but I would, if I, if I may, just to echo Councillor Tadman's remarks about Elevate Plus, I think with uh, technology and the role that that's playing, um, I interfering in our workforce and, and the very real reality that uh, someone, you know, a next generation will, will potentially work in 10 different fields in their lifetime, the uh, ability to upskill throughout one's career uh, couldn't, be, couldn't be underestimated, and, and I can't stress the importance of that program. It's a remarkable program. Program and um, and I'm pleased that you went and I would echo her sentiments and encourage anyone to go and, and see that uh, remarkable program and graduation in action. So I'll start with uh, modernizing municipalities funding. As you know, uh, the provincial government announced a one-time investment of 200 million in March of 2019. 2019 to help Ontario's small and rural municipalities become more efficient and modernize service delivery. Uh, this is because we know that to tackle uh, the deficit that, uh, that our, our province is in um, will require coordination at both uh, provincial and municipal levels and uh, we're all committed together in finding more effective and efficient ways to deliver services that better support uh, the residents of our community. Uh, Brighton received a one-time unconditional payment of $619,005 to modernize the agenda, better deliver services, and reduce the ongoing costs of providing those services. And of course, um, a letter from, from my office was sent on March 27 of 2019. So I'm very, uh, very keen to hear um, um, how that money has been spent and, uh, and look forward to, to any questions you might have on that. Municipal strategy. Um, in uh, furthering on on that discussion, um, this wasn't just a one-time piece, but we're very much committed to working alongside our municipalities um, as we go forward um, into the years ahead. And to that effect, uh, Minister Clark announced that Ontario is providing an additional 143 million to municipalities to help them lower costs and improve services for local residents over the long term. Um, that entails a five-point plan, and I, I'm to, to date aware of of um, of of the county has. Has applied through that funding, so um, I 
I, I certainly welcome that application and was briefed from the county on that and I, and I, I think that was an excellent proposal that they put together. Um, but I, of course, this is open to all of our lower tiers as well and I would encourage you to make an application. Um, that uh, that modernizing municipalities of fund, the aforementioned funding that I mentioned is open to our 405 small and rural municipalities and that is open through till 2022-2023 and uh, to discuss the five-year plan just briefly to touch on it, um, one of the additional uh, measures we've taken is proposed um, aligning our budget cycles. I know one of the big challenges municipalities have faced with respect to funding envelopes from the province is they've said it doesn't align often with, with our fiscal uh, year end, so um, we've put that forward to our municipalities and look forward to the feedback um, and valuable input on how budget cycles affect funding allocations for the vital programs that you provide residents of Brighton and how we can better align that um, and, and improve the flow of funding. Um, in addition, the voters list in response to a long-standing request uh, from municipalities through AMO, our government is also proposing to eliminate duplication by combining the provincial and municipal voters lists, giving Elections Ontario the responsibility of managing one list. In addition, a regional government review, uh, we just clarified, I know many of you have asked about regional government review, that local communities should decide what's best for them when it comes to their governance, uh, decision making and service delivery. Uh, so that was communicated again uh, through through Minister Clark. Uh, so that will not be done uh, through, through us at the provincial level. Um, Number three, uh, investing in Canada infrastructure program. I know uh, many of you, uh, we have spoken at length about the ICIP program. Um, for those who I haven't, that's a $30 billion 10-year infrastructure program that's cost-shared between the federal and provincial and municipal governments. And uh, as in response to long-standing requests from municipalities at the AMO, we, um, after after what I, you know, after years of, of requests, um, the current government responded to allow four intakes. That was predominantly be for smaller municipalities. I know I, I heard that loud and clear in my first meeting with, with Crammy and Asheville Norwood in our riding, but that the, the inability to delineate between different streams was preventing municipal staff from, from prioritizing. And many, in many respects, um, given the smaller municipalities, that was forcing staff to prioritize between two vital uh, projects and just an ability to provide multiple intake streams um, multiple intake intakes I should say through four streams was a request and in response to that uh, we answered through four different streams rural and northern um, we have our green stream parks and rec and public transit um, so those four streams we've had multiple intakes uh, through those four streams and I just wanted to touch on the green stream, uh, which is the fourth uh, fourth stream of ICIP that our government has opened, the sixth intake since taking office. Um, as you know, we've nominated over 350 projects for federal government approval. Uh, that's quite substantial in, in, in year one in government, a number of which um, are from, from our riding. So I, uh, given the recent federal election, have, uh, have already spoken to our federal member about that and prioritized the other projects close to our heart, which are, are in this riding. Uh, green stream uh, first intake uh, is for urgent and critical local water, wastewater, and stormwater infrastructure needs. Um, as of Monday, October 28th, uh, Ministry of Infrastructure had begun accepting applications for the green stream. The intake will be open for 12 weeks with the deadline to submit uh, being Wednesday, January 22nd. As outlined uh, by the federal government, we're working closely with them um, on supporting reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and enabling greater adaptation and resilience of the impacts of extreme uh, weather and disaster mitigation. I know, um, Mr. Mayor, we, we toured um, some of the impacts of, of the flooding in Lake Ontario. Um, so I know that this is close to this community's heart and I've spoken with a number of residents about it. So I think the Green Stream presents us with an opportunity to align um, all three levels of government. Um, in response to that and of course um, for broader pro projects um, uh, you know that we can work together on combating and, and reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. A community culture and recreational stream um, that was a stream that uh, recently I gather the municipality of Brighton did apply uh, through that stream. Um, the ministry is currently looking at uh, eligibility and checking applications against the criterion outlined by both the provincial and federal governments. Um, the letter that I sent uh, on that stream 
Stream was October 21st, and sorry on the aforementioned Green Stream, I wrote a letter uh, to Brighton dated uh, October 25th as well. So at each stream I've been writing, our municipalities just advising them of the specific stream when the application intake uh, opens and encouraging um, the municipalities to reach out to set up meetings so that I can advocate. And with respect to the community culture and recreational stream, I would say um, just uh, for future in advance, the opportunity to sit down and, and outline that priority in advance certainly helps me in advocating on behalf of the municipality. Um, we have three different upper tiers that uh, that uh, I represent in the in the ridings boundaries. I didn't set them up, uh, but we of course have Durham, uh, Peterborough, and Northumberland. And so the ability to to get upstream and to work with you and get fully briefed on the projects. I know most of us we touch base on this on an ongoing basis, either at events or in the regular meetings we have. So I traditionally have a uh, you know have an ability to look upstream at that. But uh, but any chance to get an in-depth briefing helps me prioritize um, the projects for our riding and deliver for, for the residents of our community. Um, the Celebrate Ontario, um, just shifting gears beyond ICIP, um, Celebrate Ontario, uh, the applications for intake for 2021, 2020-2021 uh, is now open. Um, so I'm pleased to announce that and the, prog the program has been updated and uh, new for this year in response to what certainly I've been hearing from our arts and culture community, from our municipalities, and uh, in recognition of the importance of bringing communities together, we're really pleased to announce that this uh, funding will include Canada Day celebrations um, in the multi and, uh, and included in multicultural programming. Um, that stream is open until Tuesday, January 21st, 2020. So um, I would encourage the municipality, if they have an interest, please let me know and let's get uh, an application in. Um, and I wrote a letter uh, to that effect on December 13th, 2019. In addition, um, within uh, the, that Ministry of Tourism, Culture, Sport and Heritage, uh, Ontario Trillium Foundation, um, really pleased uh, to announce today, I know this is very close to the resident of Brighton's uh, hearts, that the municipality of Brighton did receive 125000 as a capital grant from Ontario Trillium Foundation over the next 12 months to expand the existing skateboard park. I know that stems from conversations I had with residents and with many of you on Canada Day, so really pleased to announce that that has been approved and uh, Brighton will be receiving 125,000. Uh, so that's really exciting. Um, the Ontario health teams, again, shifting gears now to health. Um, I know I'm running all over the place here trying to get all the updates in in the 10 minutes, but we'll answer questions on any any one of those are, and beyond after. But Ontario health team, um, we just recently announced in Colburn, uh, the the Ontario health team that Northumberland was one of uh, was one of 24 teams approved uh, to roll out our, our in stage one and and. Um, was selected as a pilot uh, to roll out, as I said, one of those 24 teams. I can't underestimate the importance, um, having uh, been involved in discussions with our with Minister Elliott. Of course, Minister Elliott did come out a number of months ago to sit down with the planning team in our early stages. Um, this is quite significant. I mean, we were one of the smallest communities, and there was a lot of concern that Northumberland's ability, um, we would have to be forced to look to either Belleville, to Brighton, or to Durham to apply. And uh, sticking with the guns, I fully supported the team and sticking within Northumberland. I um, was really pleased that Lakeview Family Health team was one of the original signators um, on that, that uh, we were successful. And that speaks to two things. One, um, the existing collaborations already underway within the county of Northumberland. Um, and uh, again, I would, with uh, members of our upper tier in, in attendance tonight, would like to commend, obviously, the county's in involvement in that. I think we're one of the only health teams that involves upper upper tier in the application. So. Uh, with a, a critical role that they play in the delivery of services. I thought that was especially uh, poignant for our application. Um, and and it was really, I mean, it shifts our transformation of health care, unlike the LINs, which, uh, which, you know, we I heard from so many residents in the last election about uh, a top-heavy, sort of bloated, upper um, bureaucratic uh, health care delivery model. Um, this is designed locally. This is designed by pre-existing groups locally. 
And, um, you know, that was echoed at that announcement. Um, and thank you for being there, uh, Mayor. I think that was a really important announcement. And uh, I think it's going to be exciting. And what we're going to see in year one, volunteer peer support initiatives, it's about getting the right healthcare professional at the right level of intervention. We know people go to the emergency room when they don't need to be there. That's where they end up, and that costs the taxpayers a substantial amount of money. So getting the right level of care at the right intervention is going to be critical. Um, especially when we look upstream for mental health and other uh, addictions issues as well. I mean, it's critical that we get those supports upstream. A second, community paramedicine. I know um, that the county's been long, um, you know, pushing for a community paramedicine project and leveraging the skills and training of paramedics. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to see that that will be rolling out as one of the priorities. I have been additional with the wind down of the, the LIN, been looking at uh, providing additional funds uh, from, from the province for that project. Uh, Rural outreach clinics, again, I just am on the heels of a meeting in Grafton at one of our uh, good doctor's clinics there and the need to service rural and remote communities. Um, so our rural outreach clinics will be the third uh, focus and the fourth on digital health. Um, we know uh, learning lessons from the past and uh, very expensive lessons, um, the importance of, of digital health and, uh, of course, o Ontario uh, o OTN is, of course, critical to our delivery of that, um, but I think we can look at population served and scope of services and, and that will expand over, over time with uh, digital health. Uh, so that's um, you know really, really exciting there. In addition to record funding we've received to Campbellford Memorial, I mean that hospital was left on life support, a uh, five million injection in year one of our government has put that hospital on pathways to sustainability. Um, Northumberland Hills Hospital, again, a medium-sized hospital. We've addressed the historical funding inadequacy um, that for, for far too long under the previous government le led to underfunding um, at uh, the hospital level. So we've uh, committed to addressing that and in addition to providing just under $4 million to address historical inadequacies, which was meant um, not, uh, it's, it's not, you know, I think we don't need to look to administrators or, or my, my, uh, uh, my comments on that, I think I would encourage you to look to what our, our, our physicians, nurses, and allied health professionals are saying, um, and, and they were, were quite prominent at that announcement, and I think that's going to be very well received as we work to ending hallway health care. Um, Hospice as well, another priority. I know Ed's house is under construction. We have Workworth. I'm working with Norwood on their application, and we've got some exciting news coming on the western side of our, our riding too in the next uh, few weeks. Um, ending to healthcare and shifting to job creation, again, I think. Um, We've seen, um, with uh, relative stagnation across the rest of the country in November, um, positive numbers. Ontario's leading uh, the, the country with respect to job creation. Uh, since taking office in June of 2018, employment in Ontario has increased by 271,600 jobs. Um, and one of the things I, I felt important to highlight is, is the number of entrepreneurs has increased uh, by 85,300. And I think as I've, I've been working with a number of our youth uh, with Venture 13 initially, Venture Kids initiative in uh, GTA and seeing what some of the bright youth specifically from Brighton have brought forward on agriculture and others um, you know that number and that entrepreneurship that we're trying to foster as a government and creating the conditions for that is it was especially important um, to highlight and finally uh, just in closing um, the the um, the ride programming and our police service boards across uh, this county will be receiving money um, to support ride programming um, at uh, Christmas and at holiday season. Um, you know, I think it's important to highlight the fact that uh, we, we don't ever want anybody to, to drink and drive. That's never okay. And um, to foster uh, education and awareness on those consequences of that. And choosing alternate alternatives. I'll be volunteering with the uh, Red Nose, um, Operation Red Nose, but uh, encouraging that and supporting our, our frontline men and women in police services and delivering um, on those important ride programs that keep our streets safe and, uh, and, and keep people alive. And Brighton uh, Police Service Board and Brighton Police Services uh, as a part of a Northumberland Detachment will be receiving, uh, unique to this area, $8,853. And I've had an opportunity to join um, all three, uh, Coburg Port Hope and Northumberland on ride-alongs and have participated in a number of those ride programmings from the costs uh, to do them. Um, I, I think that's welcome, will be welcome news as well and to support those, those programs at, at holiday season.
So with that, um, thank you very much again for giving me this opportunity. It's great to be here in Brighton and would love to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Pacini. We appreciate your update and I will open the floor to members of council for questions of clarification. Members of council, Councillor LeBlanc. Well, thank you for taking me up on my offer to come to speak to council and giving us all this good news, David. I would like to talk to you on the jobs, the 287,000 jobs that were created. As you know, last month there was an announcement that across Canada, probably outside of Ontario, there was 71,600 jobs lost. And the month before, uh, there was 60,000 jobs lost. And the month before that, there was another 50,000. So how are, we, how are we gonna pay for all our infrastructure, our healthcare, our teachers and everything, if we keep on losing jobs and we don't go towards the entrepreneurial spirit. But I like to see that we've created 83,000 new entre young entrepreneurs coming into the market. What is the, what is the government gonna do to continue this on as the previous government didn't do it? They used to chastise a lot of the people for it. Well, thanks very much for the question. I think um, that's an excellent point on, on small businesses and entrepreneurship. I, I certainly think I'm starting from not, not treating our small businesses with contempt, but creating the conditions. So we've reduced small business tax rates. Um, we've encouraged small businesses to reinvest in their companies through tax incentives that we've rolled out in budget 2019. Um, in addition to uh, fostering entrepreneurship, I mean, we've committed to ending the skilled trades gap with a modernizing the skilled trades and apprenticeships act. Um, that's followed through with increased funding for Kawartha Pine Ridge School Board um, at the college and university level, of course, um, expanding programming at the college level, Durham College and a number of others, um, increasing our, our placements and working with the high skilled majors program um, in high school. Uh, but again, as we look here, I think it's creating the conditions. What we can do at the provincial level is create the conditions and I think we've seen strong growth. And that's not to say we haven't seen growth in the public sector too. We have seen public sector growth as well. We need a robust public service to deliver the services we depend on, but your point on how do we service all of that without generating taxation revenue. I mean, we know we lost 300 and something manuf thousand manufacturing jobs. And uh, through strategic investments, we've seen uh, expansion at Weedabix through provincial investments. We've seen um, expansion into industrial parks in Port Hope area. Um, you know, and that's just not cherry picking specific areas, but these are investments, I mean, to create the conditions from an infrastructure perspective, the conditions from uh, alleviating the tax burden, WSIB premiums, um, obviously, the the overnight approach to minimum wage increase, which was killing small businesses, uh, and providing long-term predictability. That's what it's all about, predictability. Predictability for you and your funding um, for municipalities and predictability for our small businesses. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, you talked about a number of areas in health care. Um, one area that we struggle with in a lot of our a lot of the uh, smaller areas, um, towns and cities, is uh, is uh, attracting and attaining doctors. Um, and I'm sure you get this, this question often. And, and people often look to us to fix that problem. And it's a difficult problem. Um, we've tried many different ways of, of getting doctors here. But the bottom line, from what we understand, we've been told, is that there just aren't enough doctors. And is there anything that can be done about that, that uh, you, you're, you're talking about doing or that we should know about? Well, that's an excellent question, and I have heard it especially loud and vocal from Brighton. I know there was a de uh, an unfortunate recent departure of a physician, and I spoke to a number of people um, who are having to pay for their records um, to get their health records. So um, having said that, I'm, I'm pleased that I think under the leadership of this council, we now have a, an approach to physician recruitment. Um, I know our municipalities, and important for everyone to know the public, that our municipalities play an important role in that, and that uh, under the leadership of this council. Um, Brighton has now signed on with uh, Trenton and Quinty West for physician recruitment. And I can't underestimate that importance. I work closely with West Northumberland Physician Recruitment. I know Trent Hills has their own as well. And so you play an important role in that. Um, so I would commend you for stepping up to the plate and, and doing that. Um, at the provincial level, it's something I can and must do more on. Obviously increasing the number of positions for residency training. This is a career I was in before politics. Um, but um, our, under our government, we have increased uh, after cutting residency uh, positions, specifically for our specialists as well. Um, we've increased that under, under this current government. And uh, working with the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, the regulatory body, and obviously the College of Family Physicians, um, this CFPC of, of, of Canada, um, I've got
got a meeting coming up in the new year with them to look um, with with them and, and our faculties of medicine about ways that we can, I mean this isn't a problem unique to our community, it's something faced in rural and northern communities across Canada on really rolling out um, opportunities for uh, for clinical training beyond just, uh, just the hospital setting but encouraging physicians to pursue opportunities in rural and northern Canada. So I have that meeting. I know people have said, I mean, do you have an answer? The answer in short is no, I don't have an overnight answer, but I have spoken to CPSO. I've got a meeting with CFPC set up in the new year, uh, looking with our faculties of medicine, um, how we can do perhaps using Brighton as a pilot, um, given the challenges that are faced here. But in the immediate term, um, we're also seeing the, uh, the ability with OHT to service rural communities and that pilot clinic and pop-up opportunity to ensure you're seen by a clinician. It doesn't have to be a doctor. It can be an RN or an RPN. It depends. And the ability to get that clinical support uh, might reduce the need for uh, the more acute uh, care you might need if you can get that care uh, in advance. So that's certainly a priority of this government, um, but I fully admit I can and would love to work with you on doing more for, for Brighton. Thank you. While we're on the healthcare file, um, I've been asked it, it, how will the new OHT specifically in Northumberland or will the OHT in Northumberland impact uh, any patients in, in Brighton who receive um, healthcare to the east, it, who, who leave the riding or leave the county to go to Quinney Healthcare? My off-the-cuff answer was I seriously doubt it. That's not the intent of this this new system, but I, I would ask you to uh, to let me know if, if there there would be any impact from the vast majority of Brightonians, for example, who seek health care to the east? No, it won't. Uh, that's an excellent question. I think what they will see is the opportunity to perhaps avoid the reliance to travel further um, and get the sort of care that they're looking for locally um, in, in advance. And again, those rural and remote clinics, I mean, part of one of the big challenges we deal with here, and um, I've spoken with our paramedics about this, I did a recent ride-along with them, um, uh, as well, our MHART ride-alongs, which we've piloted um, for mental health as well, um, are, are tackling patients upstream. Um, is isolation is a big one for seniors in rural, uh, rural communities. Communities, and uh, there are many who are going into the ER frequently um, just to make contact with people and that's and that's sad and that needs support and so um, looking at it uh, across the OHT with a strategic group of volunteers who have the clinical expertise at the right level of intervention um, is something that hasn't been done that's being designed locally by our local experts not me but our, our local uh, health professionals and I think whereas before you look to the government and and where your politicians and and, and bureaucrats at the LIN are designing it. I mean, we're seeing this very much grassroots driven. And um, so what, in short, the answer will be, I think they'll see an uptake in, in, uh, in touch points with the health system because the goal of OHT at its core is to provide better patient-centered care. And the key word there being the patient when they need it um, at the right level of care. Thank you. I saw a hand over here. Councillor Tadman. Uh, Councillor or Deputy Mayor Vink stole most of my thunder in the question I was going to ask, but is there anything that your government is looking to to help support nurse practitioners? Because mm -hmm. I hear so often people, people that really need their medication have nowhere to go right now. Mm -hmm. We ha You mentioned there's one, but actually within a couple of months we're yeah, going to lose three. Now you're right. yeah. So... Um, and they can they can do a lot of the prescribing of the medication as long as there's a doctor there. So is there anything that your government can do to help us because we're we're thinking along those lines to help us uh, finance? Is there any thought in that area? Well, the answer to that I think is two: short term and long term. Short term, um, we've seen uh, we've had uh, discussions on on prescribing and and the ability of of RNs, RPNs to prescribe. Um, so we've had discussions there. That would be an immediate term. You'd see a lot of our our foes, our family health teams. They um, here have uh, RNs at the at the helm. Um, so we're, we're seeing that, and I think that's been a good local response to rural realities. The long term approach to our nursing shortages across Ontario and. 
I met um, one of our uh, Brightonian residents is actually plays a, a, a formative role with the RNAO and so she's uh, been a real catalyst in, in advocating to government and it's nice to see a young nurse and, that, and a young local nurse and a young local nurse from Brighton uh, playing a leading role in that across Ontario and one of the things they spoke to was um, degree uh, granting authority traditionally rests with our university so in the ministry that I've been appointed to we've been looking at um, ways to, to alleviate that so for example using a local example loyalist partners um, to to grant the degrees um, out of uh, I believe Hamilton or, or Niagara but the practical realities on partnering with the university means that in your final two years you're going to that school which means we lose them when they're when they leave loyalists they're gone and we never get them back because then they end up practicing um, in 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 that area and so one of the things we've been looking at is uh, is is that autonomy and the ability for the colleges to grant that so that's a long-term approach we've been having those discussions I've been engaged with them um, that's uh, you know that involves some careful stick handling with our universities of course because we don't want to disrupt the, the the strong partnerships that have evolved um, but that's needed for to to deal with that backlog and that's one of the long-term approaches we're looking to to increase the HR supply thank you and and the um, president of Loyalist College and I were having a chat a couple of weeks ago and uh, she mentioned your involvement in other areas and and appreciated your involvement there so I just want to pass okay. that on as thank well thank you uh, any other questions from members of council Councilor LeBlanc yes <coughs> over here <laughs> <laughs> Wrong the ball, the paper. Uh, one, of, one of the things, David, is that the healthcare problem was created long before you, you, you guys came into government about 15 years ago with the universities, but I'll leave it at that. My question now is for infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Because Brighton has a lot of infrastructure needs that we have to apply for grants and programs. And so I hope that you, you look at us very favorably when we, if we get to apply these right. Mm -hmm. And what's, how are how's, how you, uh, you funding these? So that thirty billion dollar initiative, I mean that's to target big big projects that no one level of government can do. And and why I think that's important is um, because it, when when people look to me, I mean it's not me going with a wand and deciding what projects we're funding. Um, this is very grassroots driven. It's our municipalities identifying critical projects, bringing it to the province. The province, we in our red tape reduction have already worked at uh, with the feds and we've had a very willing partner at the federal level to look at ways we can streamline this and we've done that. Uh, we nominated 350 projects prior uh, to the election and I mean I, I look forward and I think perhaps um, the, the current minority situation might help expedite some of uh, those decisions coming forthwith but we look forward to the decisions on those at the federal level um, but um, I think it's it's all three levels of government working together and we're seeing that and um, I know uh, that the mayor has brought up um, the needs of, of Brightonians in, in through the green stream and um, I know that's been a long-standing issue here in Brighton and and uh, just so that you're aware, um, this is one of the, the first that's been brought to my attention and I will prioritize it number one um, for our riding. And I'm being frank uh, in that because I can only be as effective as you are with me. And if, if, if we have applications that don't, that I'm not aware of and we're not continuing that two, politics is a two way street and that dialogue, I can advocate for this community and this has been brought to my attention and I will be giving it, uh, it will be a priority for me and I'll certainly be, I know it's also been brought up to our member of parliament and I think when we work in unison um, we, we'll, we'll hopefully see the results for, for, for this community. And, and just to tie on that, part, part B of that is what we've heard is there's a $3 million cap but there might be some wiggle room and yes. given that we have an $8 million project, we're hoping that the wiggle room is broad. Yes. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Yes. <laughs> no, so, I appreciate you bringing um, that to my attention. And, and I have committed to both you and, and the member of parliament that we will forward uh, the application to you so you have it, but it might be a good idea, um, CAO, to have the member of provincial parliament in uh, to provide a briefing on that. I would love uh, that. In advance of, of the appli the application closing. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Councillor Tadman. Um, I know that you know that the best way is to hammer at doors when you when you really have a need. Uh, I know that other municipalities do this and I, I've always wondered why we haven't been more 
progressive, but we need to speak to to the different ministers, and then we have to go through you to get that set up. Um, how how um, soon does that have to happen? Say, if we're going to be going to to Amo or to Roma or whatever happens to be where we're going, how many weeks or months do you need to? have ahead of time heads up to get that set up? Well, as soon as possible. I mean, to date in my experience in, in the year plus I've been in office, I've certainly been given the heads up at the county level of delegations, um, but I'd love for the municipality and, and um, you know, I'm it's a telltale's out of school, but I think the I think the um, the results speak for themselves. I and mean, mm -hmm. we do have another municipality out of our county here, but in Peterborough County, that's been very aggressive in Asheville Norwood, and and they've subsequently seen funding um, through the aggressive approach that they've taken. So I would welcome, and we'll go to bat uh, if in any meetings you'd like uh, scheduled. I would I would most definitely let me know as soon as possible. Either we can use this. Uh, appeared when the legislature's in recess to bring the minister here to see firsthand mm -hmm. the need or um, or schedule it in Toronto. Thank you. And just go ahead. And thank you. Just to follow up. <coughs> so mm -hmm. um, more the merrier in a situation yeah. like that. So you would recommend that those who are responsible for such and such infrastructure should be there at that meeting, whether it's mm -hmm. a special meeting that at AMO or something like that, or that you bring the minister here. Is that correct? Absolutely. And and I mean, this is my job, is to advocate for you and to set these meetings up. And I mean, in year one, I think we saw 15 cabinet ministers come into our riding, one of the most in the province. And if we, I unpack some of the recent wins, like um, EODF application for Pemberton Road expansion, um, they, they brought that forward to me, and that funding came a, f a few months later and but this was upstream we saw the lots the lots were sold for industrial park there was a case business case made they're diversifying the tax revenue onto industrial which is great for ratepayers and um, and that was funded so the sooner the better and uh, and you can hold me to that I will will get those meetings okay thank you any other questions from members of council um, just to bring you up to speed on the modernization funding, we'll be looking at that during our budget process, and okay. I think you'll see some IT strategy requests okay. come forward uh, in that regard. Um, and just a quick plug for Operation Red Nose, um, the wonderful thing about Brighton is we can uh, uh, approach both Northumberland and Quinty, uh, depending, <laughs> on where, depending on where we've been enjoying or, or uh, <laughs> having good Christmas cheer uh, to get us home in Brighton. So both of those are, are up and running. And um, while I have your ear, I'm just going to use the word flood assistance. Mm -hmm. Flood assistance. Mm -hmm. uh, Brighton had to take, um, or chose to take the uh, the route of um, uh, not uh, aggressively funding uh, flood assistance in the next year if if it comes about, which means um, we will provide sand and bags, but likely not uh, uh, emergency services to help uh, private property owners moving forward. We'll see how uh, how the community responds to that. I think moving forward, but um, part of that, of course is we simply don't have the tax base to be funding mm -hmm. that kind of programming uh, year after year after year. I know the lake levels aren't your responsibility, but mm -hmm. um, you know if, if, if the lake levels may remain high and if flooding becomes a, a perpetual thing on our lakeshore, as you know, Mr. Buccini, our lakeshore is residential. There's almost entirely. So with the exception of, of Presque Isle, and even a third of that is is residential. So um, we look to you to help us out in some way if, if it becomes necessary for uh, ongoing uh, uh, funding for that assistance. I, I know what we did. Um, I did note the resolution this municipality passed with the IJC, and I, I did uh, join and many of my counterparts in writing a letter to the IJC. What was really, I found, appalling was the fact that they did not respond uh, in our request for meetings and public meetings. Um, you know, we're accountable to the public, and, um, and, and there was no response to that effect. And 
particularly troubling from our point of view in Ontario was that the federal government's appointed both members from Quebec and uh, we don't have a voice in Ontario at that table at the IJC table so when it comes to lake levels um, I know our, our new member has been very very outspoken on that at the federal level I join him in, in that um, but with respect to that uh, the infrastructure needs um, provincially along the lakes um, I'd be happy to facilitate a, a broader discussion on that and, and to speak to what Mr. Lawrence did um, I think for the first time that I'm aware of flood flood concerns along the lakeshore were raised in the house in the house of Commons. right in the house of Commons. so that was uh, that was uh, I think a, a forward move on behalf of mr. Lawrence but um, uh, we'll, we'll just leave it at that yeah. with regard thank you to very much yeah, thank you thank you very thanks much thanks for the opportunity thank you and I have a motion moved by Councillor Rowley seconded by Councillor Tadman that council receive the delegation from MPP Pacini is there any discussion all in favor any opposed the motions carried thank you very much for the update our second delegation is from Rebecca Carmen housing services manager Northumberland County regarding Brighton's affordable housing strategy How are you? Good, how are you? I'm okay. Um, un unlike the MPP, I am going to hold you to your 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, <it's>, <laughs> it is life. <laughs> Uh, thank you, thank you, Your Worship, for having us here. Uh, through you, uh, I, my name is Rebecca Carmen. I'm the Housing Services Manager with Northumberland County. My apologies to the folks where my back is slightly to you. Um, with me today is Christine Pacini with SHS Consulting. She's going to walk us through a high level of the presentation of the strategy that's been developed, and then we're here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. Um, okay. Just, okay. Okay, here we go. Sorry. Uh, just quickly, I'll be reviewing um, the purpose and approach of the stra strategy, why an affordable strategy for Brighton, uh, some of the recommendations regarding actions, and then I'll just quickly go through some of the impacts for incentives. Keep on going. Um, so the primary goal of the project was to develop an affordable housing strategy for Northumberland County as well as each of the member uh, municipalities and the focus of the strategy was to increase the supply of affordable and market can you go back? I don't have it memorized. <laughs> Market rental housing through a range of tools and incentives across Northumberland. So we undertook the study in two phases, and I can probably do it. The first phase uh, was conducting a needs assessment, and some of you might have been part of uh, our presentation on that needs assessment around this time last year. Um, the second phase, which uh, we finished in March for the county, was the actual development of the strategy which included housing targets and included some uh, ideas on financial incentives and as well as a policy review. In March of 2019, uh, the strategy for the county was, was presented and after that we started uh, developing the strategies for the member municipalities. Uh, so why an affordable housing strategy uh, in Brighton? So just to start, um, we developed uh, early on a definition that we use throughout the county uh, for affordable housing, and this would be the absolute uh, maximum. So this is the threshold if we're providing any incentives uh, for affordability. In terms of rental housing, uh, the, the maximum would be rents of about 1,019, and in terms of ownership, it's about three. 316,190 and that would be affordable to uh, um, uh, um, incomes or households with incomes at the 60th income decile and that would be the top end of uh, a moderate income. In terms of housing gaps, two major gaps were identified uh, here in Brighton. Uh, the first one was the need for a more diverse housing supply, including um, housing for smaller households as well as accessible options. So what we're seeing uh, when we uh, conducted the demand and supply here in Brighton was a mismatch between what you have and what uh, the current need is or, or the emerging needs in your community. 
So some of what you have, of course, uh, is uh, a significant supply of single detached uh, dwellings, about 87.4%, and that compares to about 794 in Northumberland, and then less so in terms of uh, the multi-residential units. So that's, uh, that's what your supply is. However, what we're seeing in terms of your need is that uh, your households are smaller, uh, so it's uh, your uh, households are uh, uh, comprised primarily of one and two person households, so about 69, almost 70 percent of them. As well, uh, you have a significant uh, senior-led household. So your growth is happening mostly uh, in the senior household uh, area, and seniors tend to need uh, also smaller units as well as units that are uh, more accessible. You also have uh, um, a higher uh, proportion of uh, households with at least one individual with a physical disability as well as cognizant disabilities. So again, thinking about having a, a, more, um, a greater supply of accessible housing um, is a direction to go. The second uh, major um, gap that was identified is a need for support services to facilitate aging in place as well as uh, independent living. Um, what was mentioned before, um, your, your senior households uh, are, are uh, growing and they're growing uh, pretty well uh, faster than any other segment in your population. So about 36% uh, growth uh, in the last 10 years in seniors led households. Oh, did I go the wrong way? Sorry. Uh, so that, that again points to, to a need for uh, more housing for seniors and more choices for seniors. Uh, this uh, illustration here is a snapshot of your housing need, uh, the need for affordable housing in your community. I'll just point to the one area under the low income category under who is in need. Uh, that's where you have the greatest need in terms of an affordability issue. So you have um, second down uh, in this category of your low income uh, households. You have about 24% um, of your households are currently spending more than 50% of their income uh, uh, towards rent. There's more here, but I think I better keep on going uh, given the time frame. So given this need or this snapshot of need, uh, we've come up with some recommendations to address the need. Um, and I will say, uh, similar to other member municipalities, the answer or, or the solutions are, are complex. We need many uh, players involved, many levels of government to help address uh, the needs uh, in the communities. Uh, what we've done is come up with um, uh, some recommendations around policies and regulations that's primarily related to your official plan and your zoning bylaw. Uh, also there are some recommendations around programs and funding, education and awareness, as well as collaboration and partnerships. Under the policies and regulations, um, the good news is um, that the official plans that I think you just approved very recently are, and that are now uh, at the county for review, your new policy, is very much in keeping with what's been recommended here. So I think things are going uh, in the right direction uh, there. Um, I'm just going to quickly highlight a few maybe um, uh, recommendations uh, for your consideration and all of these are for your consideration. So we have developed for the county as well as all the member municipalities an affordable housing target. So the county's overall target is 90 uh, new affordable units per year. Uh, we're recommending four units for Brighton, uh, but part of the process is for uh, staff to work together to confirm that 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 unit, uh, that counter, that target of four is appropriate for you here. I'm going to keep on going. Some of these, uh, as I mentioned, some of these uh, um, uh, recommendations are already uh, in place. Um, again, I've, I've identified here the need for a more diverse supply and it sounds like you, you have some policies to address that. Um, in terms of funding, uh, as you probably have read, uh, Northumberland is, uh, the county do, has uh, established a affordable and rental housing pilot program uh, and that they're, they're hoping that all municipalities will use a similar approach to applying, uh, having um, 
interested individuals apply for funding. Um, and number 12 is something you already have in place, a community improvement area process, but now you just need to implement it in order for you to provide incentives should you choose, uh, for example, to provide uh, tools for affordable housing. Okay, I'm going to keep on going. Uh, they're all in, I'm happy to uh, speak to any of these recommendations. Uh, we were asked to highlight um, uh, the potential impact of some of the incentives that, that we're recommending. Again, these are all for your consideration. They don't all need to be done. It could be, uh, you know, you do, you, you might consider one, you might consider on a project by project basis, and that's, that's around the possibility of providing uh, land and at a reduced price, the possibility of providing forgivable loans or deferrals uh, in relation to building permits or planning freeze, uh, fees, and then uh, grants or uh, deferrals in terms of property taxes. We created a performa prototype for this. Uh, in your municipality, uh, we, it, the prototype is a, a 12 unit, six duplexes. I'm not gonna go through all the assumptions, but basically the project would be about a $3 million uh, project. Um, that project, to be financially viable, the owner of that, that uh, development would have to charge rents at about $1,659 a month, which is, about 71% above that affordable threshold we talked about earlier, or about the average market rent in the area. So th the next few slides are just illustrating if you provided some incentives, what impact it would have on the rents. So providing grants in lieu of the building permits, you can see would reduce, would slightly reduce the rents to about 170% of average market rent. If you were to provide grants in lieu of the development charges, that has a more significant impact. It would reduce it to about 166% of average market rent. Uh, if the land, if there was a way to find land that you could donate or provide uh, on a long-term lease basis at a nominal uh, fee, that, that has a significant impact of reducing rents to about 158% of average market rent. Property tax, of course, this is a difficult one for a member municipality, but it does have a significant impact or could have on reducing the rents down to about 153%. And then if you were able to provide all the incentives on, on an individual project, excluding the land, it would bring the rents down to about 148% of average market rent and including the land is about 134% of average market rent. Still doesn't quite get us at the rent that, that would be affordable but but it is uh, much uh, you know more affordable than what uh, probably they would have to charge for a financially viable project. There are, I'm not going to go through too many of these slides, but there are two federal uh, programs available that could complement the incentives. It's the co-investment fund and the construction rental financing and there's some slides here on what this is all about but I'll just show you the one that has the impact here. What this slide is showing you here, it pretty well summarizes the impact of, of all the incentives. So as I first mentioned, if we don't have any incentives, most likely the owner of that property would need to charge rents of about $1,659 a month. If if you were able if, to provide all the incentives uh, that I identified before at the municipal level, that rent can come down to about 1300 If we layer, or if the owner layers um, the uh, co-investment funding, you could have about 30% of the units come in at, at about 80% of medium rent, which is a nice rent, 746 and the balance could come in at 970 And then the other program that is available that doesn't have a, a grant but, but is very uh, favorable um, interest rate is the rental construction financing and you could have those units come in at about 100% of average market rent. So sorry, very quick presentation. This was just meant to give you an indication of what you could do with the incentives. Again, uh, many of the recommendations here are for your consideration. We're not suggesting you do them all, but just uh, some suggestions on how you could meet the affordable needs in your community. Thank you, Ms. Pacini, Ms. Carmen. Any questions from members of council? Councillor Tadman. 
Let me start not with a question, if that's okay with you, Mayor. Sure. Um, we just uh, visited the food bank before we came here tonight, and we know the need. And we know that people are paying so much in rent that they have to, you know, they, they still have to feed their children and themselves. So um, I think that we need to work very hard to see how we can help. But on the other hand, I'll, I'll find a question in here somewhere. I'm sure you will. <laughs> um, on the other hand, we can't expect developers to lose money. They're not in the business to lose money, so there has to be incentives. And I think there's some good examples of these incentives that you've brought forward. And I guess I don't have a question for you, but uh, the mayor can slap my hands and I'll, we'll carry on anyway. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from members of council? Councillor Anderson? Um, I just noted you recommended that, uh, excuse me, that Brighton uh, has gets four units per year. Uh, that's that's a pretty low target, isn't it? Considering everything that would go into this, uh, if you know, I know just the other communities like Coburg, thirty-three or whatever it was, and Port Hope more, but four for Brighton. Why? Why is that number? Where did that come from? Yeah. All right. Uh, so when we identified, uh, when we calculated the 90%, it's really based on new units coming on stream. So we're, we're saying as you build new units, and it's based on your own official plan uh, policies on growth, we target it that way. So we're not trying to go back and, and fill the gap. We're trying to move forward on that. And we... The distribution. So uh, many of the other smaller municipalities also had three, four, um, as as their targets. I th I think the county would be happy w with more oh, <laughs> if, just, if you're just, if you're willing. We were trying to spread it out. Just doesn't seem that aggressive uh, to to meet the need. And, and I presume, and we all heard it tonight too, when we before we came here, that there's a real strong need. Um, uh, the other thing is when you create create these units, uh, we talk about seniors and that, and we, the word need. Who grabs up these facility, these these homes and these apartments and these things? Who 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 will grab these up uh, when they come available? It's a lot of times it's people from out of the area. It's people from the, the GTA or, or major markets, not necessarily perhaps the local people that are looking for an opportunity to move into a you know downsize or whatever the term would be so four units you know what I mean seniors housing affordable housing so the question is how do you who and I hate the word again I say who controls that I can share, shed some share some comments I don't have answers to everything um, the other note on the four units is that what we did was when we set a target was we looked at a percentage of new buildings. So just another um, further on that is that we're, our target is 25% of all new units created should be affordable and that's what equals 90 uh, overall as the county and then we looked at proportion population and everything else. In terms of who need who would end up with it, um, I can't speak to some of the challenges is around how we manage that. But what I can tell you as the central, as the man, service manager for the centralized wait list for social housing, including all of our rent gear to income units, that the majority of folks on our wait list are Northumberland County residents. Um, the other thing to speak of when we talk about who's gonna get the units, one of the things we're looking at are common application processes, common uh, template, more uh, agreements to put on notice for the new projects that would include really looking at the level of income of that incoming tenant. We want to make sure that affordable units that we create are being t are being um, taken by folks who need that affordable housing um, so that the income of that household coming in matches what that rent is and not necessarily someone who is of higher income status taking for something along those lines. So we're looking at how we can creatively and within those agreements verify who's coming, what households are coming in and to make sure it matches the needs of the community alongside the needs of households that, that so need it's it. it's rent geared to income basically. Right. In some ways. It's, In some ways. Yeah, not quite because these are just would be affordable, but it would be upon housing. We'd want to make sure that that household income matches what that rent is, mm -hmm. and we would go from there. Okay. Councillor LeBlanc. <coughs> 
Thank you. When you started your presentation, you started off that you said that you looked at the needs of Northumberland County, of the of the Northumberland, the county first. Well, if I go to a doctor, I I don't want him to tell him tell me that I have a headache if I have a bellyache. So basically, you should have looked at what the county, the, the, the town wanted, the municipalities wanted, what they needed before you went to the county. And then you would have had a strategy plan because you, you've kind of said the county wants you to do this, but you did come to see what the needs were down here. Then wait, one more question. When you talk well, about actually, let's let them answer that one. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so I think that... Um, while we did have the Northumberland County strategy drafted first uh, to align with the overall systems, I think it's really important to highlight, and I think in some of the slides we, we went by really quickly, is the level of engagement that we had with member municipalities at the forefront alongside residents. Um, so we hosted uh, numerous engagement sessions, 16. Um, we had engagement sessions with member municipalities um, and our council at Northumberland County uh, last year. We we had uh, meetings with all staff. We had individual meetings with Brighton staff alongside other uh, municipalities individually on an individual basis to identify the needs and the gaps. All of our Statistics Canada data, we purchased custom data tabulations that would have shown geographic differences. That's why we can really get down to the granular to say that this is what's happening in Brighton um, compared to Northumberland County as a whole because we've really looked at those different things. Um, so we we have done as much we've done a lot to try to make sure that we've engaged the lower tier municipalities alongside residents to identify the needs of of communities. Councilor Tadman, I have a question. Uh, just so everybody around the table and the people here tonight understand, the the county uh, is responsible for the social housing that's here. Uh, I've been around here a long time, so I pretty well understand it, but I always couldn't use a refresher. Could you just tell us how that works and how many units we have in Brighton? Of course. So in Brighton, uh, you're correct. Um, there are 57 units of rent geared to income housing in Brighton owned and operated by the Northumberland County Housing Corporation. Um, in order to become a resident there, they ha a household has to meet um, legislative requirements for rent geared to income. The county administers the centralized waitlist for all units. Currently the waitlist for those 57 units in Brighton is approximately uh, four years and represents about 10% of our waitlist or folks that are looking to, to come to Brighton or are in Brighton. Um, the other, some of the other services that we have in Brighton that I don't think are as well known is that we have supported Habitat for Human Humanity through some of their home ownership programs here in Brighton and we also do have um, a number of households in receipt of support from the county either through rent supplements who supported our been supported through our renovate Northumberland program or other housing allowances so we do have various other services outside of those 57 units um, supporting folks in in Brighton maintaining housing. Councillor LeBlanc. Thank you Mayor through you. Uh, <coughs> When you you talk about uh, affordability, affordability housing, and you want the town to reduce their fees on developers, did you know the county is looking to raising fees on developers through the town of Brighton? Did you, when you look at you take 42% of our taxes, you're looking at the town to do taxes and rebates. Has the county looked at uh, reducing the taxes that they charge the town to probably 36%? So it would give us this chance to have the loans and stuff. It's easy to talk affordability through one way, but have a mindset of the other. You gotta get both to connect. And right now it's not connecting with me at all, what you're doing. I think we really, that's a question we actually, we've gotten quite a few times and we really understand it. Um, some of the challenges alongside all of this is the legislative requirements under the Municipal Act of what level of government has the ability to make those, to charge those fees and to do those different pieces. So a lot of the tools that we're proposing or we're identifying as tools in the toolbox to consider pulling out when we need it are because they are under the legislative uh, authority within the member municipalities. The county's interim affordable housing policy speaks to some of the things you're talking about of coming alongside uh, and offering property tax exemptions where we can, um, but the county is actually has a lot more of um, 
a narrow requirement under the legislation for us to to look at specific, specifically only affordable housing units, but we are looking at all of our different fees that we're looking at and everything and considering affordable housing and where that would fit within, within it. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, and thank you for your report. We've been talking about affordable housing for quite a while, and uh, there certainly is a need, and we certainly do need um, help and guidance. Uh, I don't think this is going to be easy for us to figure out how to make this work, but we certainly need to uh, move in that direction. So I appreciate what you've uh, come in and the info that you've given us. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Anything else? I have a motion then. Thank you very much. Moved by Councillor Tadman, seconded by Councillor Rowley, that Council receive the delegation from Rebecca, Car Rebecca Carmen, Housing Services Manager, Northumberland County, regarding bright and affordable housing strategy. Did we just want to receive this, or did we want to refer it to staff uh, for a policy recommendation? Something like that. Councillor Tadman, it's your motion. Yes, I'd like to refer it to staff, but not necessarily put a date on it. Because we I won't know put that, a date on it. No. Yeah, that's Thank a, you. that's a big project. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, you don't have to second. I'm asking Councillor Rowley if she'd agree to the referral. Yeah. Okay. Good. So I've added and refer to staff for policy recommendations. Does that work? Uh, any any further questions on this then? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, would these policies then have to be considered under our official plan then as well? Is that what you're thinking? Well, that would be uh, something staff would advise. They'd let okay. us know whether it would be zoning or OP or, and then we could make decisions about uh, those kinds of amendments. Okay, thank Moving you. Moving forward, you're welcome. Anything further? All in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. And our final delegation is from Leanna Palmer, Codrington Farmers Market Update on the market and request for municipal insurance policy or rider that relates to special events and the artisans. I'll just get you to push the purple button in front of you. There you go. Uh, with me is Margaret Appleby, who is the chair of the Codrington Farmers Market, and I am the treasurer. <clears throat> the Codrington Farmers Market has just completed five years of operation, and we intend to keep going for a long time. Our focus has been on local vendors and products and our perimeter is 40 kilometers. Many of our vendors are Brighton taxpayers. Because we are in a rather remote location, it has been necessary to find enticements other than high quality products to attract customers. People need to drive at least 10 to 20 minutes at least to get there and it's not really practical to drive all that way just to pick up a few vegetables for the week. So to make it a destination, we offer live music, free coffee, picnic tables under canopies, and we have vendors with snack foods. An added bonus for us during the past two years has been the library opening during market hours. Although we are a small market, our expenses are significant. We spend a lot of money on advertising, $2,600 in 2019, and we have no choice given that we are the only market around that's not in a town, and as mentioned, customers have to drive out into the country to visit us. Also, our music program is expensive <clears throat> because we pay a stipend to each act, and there are two a week. That's $2,500 per market season. Our insurance and membership costs are high, and there are other ongoing costs as well. We started inviting artisans to join us once a month inside the hall as a means of attracting more visitors. There is no charge to the public, and the money we charged uh, the artisans eased our financial burden a bit. The first year we did this, we were unaware that the artisans should have insurance policies. When we learned this and told the vendors, we lost at least half of them. It was too expensive for the income they realized, or it was just too much of a hassle for people such as seniors who had knitting to sell. The other attraction we have tried is special events. 
Some of you will remember the Free Ethnic Food Festival we did a few years back. Free food brought out hundreds of visitors. There are many other events that we would like to run, such as an antique show or more food-related experiences, but the majority of vendors aren't willing to get a special insurance policy to cover their participation. These policies are expensive, and then they have to pay our fee as well. Why don't we just raise the vendor fees? We strive to keep our farmer's market fees reasonable so that our vendors make money. No one is getting rich, but we don't want to see them putting out a lot of extra dollars in stall fees to cover things like insurance for special events. Many of our vendors are already donating separately to the music program and to prize baskets. We think of our market as a municipal attraction and destination, not a Codrington activity. And many of our shoppers and visitors come from all areas of Brighton. We hope the municipality thinks of us when promoting tourist attractions in the area. So the reason we're here this evening is to ask Council to help us with the insurance problems that relate to special events and the artisans. And we do pay for the Farmer's Market Vendor's Insurance Policy, and it was $1,100 in 2019, and we will continue to do that. We are hoping the municipality can add a policy or rider to their existing coverage to enable us to continue with the artisan markets once a month and special events over the season. This would certainly ensure the viability as a self-sufficient market and it would allow us to expand the artisan market or the artisan program significantly and that would likely attract more visitors to the municipality. We do not have a dollar figure to offer. As noted, we would be looking at an inclusion in the municipal coverage. Thank you very much. And we will certainly be happy to answer any questions about our market. Thank you both very much. And I anticipate that at the end, what we would do is refer this to budget, but we'll see what council wants to do. And I'll open the floor to members of council for questions. Councilor Tadman. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, just to, to go along with what you're doing there, and you know that I'm a great supporter, especially of the Tuesday morning uh, breakfast. Uh, you can't beat that anywhere for three bucks and, and also a chance to win 50-50 draw and, and all kinds of prizes. But it's, I just wanted to comment. It's, it's five dollars with the 50-50. <laughs> you don't have to buy them. I know, but it's easier. You just give your five dollars over and then you, you walk away. True. I apologize. Go ahead, Council. Dad. But anyways, um, I just wanted to mention that we have, through the Quinty Access, we have a bus that travels, um, it stops at No Frills, it comes down through Gosport, goes out to Presque and all the way. And it's not just for Codrington. They can get off at any stop all the way along. I think it, you, Councillor Bateman, and, and you, we rode it, and, and it was a lot of fun. And hopefully that will encourage people like at Preskill to come out there and also to support the other people that have markets in the area. I had something else to say, and that slipped my mind. But anyways, I, I would support this. Let's see if um, we'll have to talk to the the um, Linda over here, who, who looks after our finances so well. Uh, but we will refer this, I'm sure, to budget anyways. And thank you for all the work you guys do. It's amazing. Through, I don't know, do you ever go home? Or just <laughs> at night, maybe, once in a while? We're doing fine. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Councillor Tadman. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. And uh, yeah, the, the market's lovely and lots of great things going on. So <coughs> I'd love to see us do something. Um, I'm not sure that it's the insh... From what I understand, uh, there's uh, we. I'm on the Apple Fest committee, and all of those people have to have their own insurance too. And it's actually to protect them because our coverage won't cover them. Uh, but maybe there's another way we can. I mean, obviously, uh, I'm not an expert, so I would love to hear from our director of uh, finance. But uh, if there's some way that we can support you to help, maybe we can help with the advertising, or there's another way to help. But I know you want to reduce the cost so that your your vendors don't have to pay that. Um, but uh, I'd love to hear. Um, you know, we have, of course, we have rules and ways, and insurance companies have rules that we have to follow. But if there's a way that we can make something happen, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, Councilor LeBlanc. Through you, uh, your, uh, your Mayor, I would support this. I've used the facility. I like the way it's uh, 
uh, 21% has to be local grown and farmers. I think the more participation, the more people that we get out in the rural area to come and visit and for a ride, the better. It's good for business, it's good for advertising our farms, which our farms don't advertise enough in, the, in, their, in their products that they grow. And the events that you have there and the local bakeries that break at home and everything, it's a place for them to, for them to go. And I would support this to go because one thing is a viable farmer's market is a viable community. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Blanc. Anyone else? So I have a motion moved by, Count and thank you very much okay. for your delegation. I have a motion moved by Councillor Tadman, second by Councillor Rowley. The Council receives uh, Leanna Palmer, De Codrington Farmers Market Delegation regarding insurance policy for special events and artisans. And uh, Councillor Tadman, may I add and refer to budget for, um, for refer to budget deliberations? Absolutely. Sorry, Councillor Rowley, I assume you're okay with it. I apologize, yeah. So I've added and referred to budget deliberations. Is there anything further? All in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion is carried. We'll move on to citizens' comments, if there are any. If there are not, thank you very much. So into staff reports we go. Our first staff report is with regard to the Smithfield Community Safety Zone. Mr. McGee, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? Thank you, Your Worship. I have nothing to add. Thank you, sir. I have a motion moved by Council Rowley, second by... I do, in fact, have a motion moved by Council Rowley, seconded by Councillor Tadman, that Council passes the proposed Community Safety Zone Bylaw for Smithfield Public School located in Smithfield, Ontario. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion is carried. Our next report is with regard to rate of speed bylaw. Mr. McGee, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? Nothing to add. And I have a motion moved by Councillor Anderson, seconded by Councillor Bateman, that Council receives the report dated December 16, 2019, being a bylaw to regulate speed limits on specific municipal roads, and further the Council authorize the approval and execution of the amended rate of speed bylaw as outlined in Attachment 6 to this report. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion's carried. And 9.3, we have removed uh, the item, um, the bylaw item. So I am uh, using my authority as chair to remove it from this agenda. We'll move on to the next item, which is 9.4, being the 2019 year end transfer report. Ms. Widdefield, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? No, I do not. I have a motion moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Anderson, that Council authorize staff to establish a Brighton Digital Archives Reserve, and that Council authorize staff to establish a Modernization Reserve Fund, and that the following contributions be made to reserves in 2019 to be utilized in 2020 or future years. One, $1,152.75 to the Brighton Digital Archive Reserve. Two, $282 to the Heritage Building Reserve. Three, $1,549.81 to the Dog Park Reserve. Four, $35,000 to the Fire Reserve. Five, $95,500 to the General Reserve for BHSC. Six, $67,500 to the Public Works Reserve for Chat and Garage. Seven, $52,749 to Public Works Reserve for Guide Rails. Eight, unspent balanced public work reserve for engineering up to $328,000. Nine, $79,000 to public works reserve for surface treatment. Ten, $619,005 to the modernization reserve fund. Eleven, $11,683 to the youth initiative reserve from grant and aid. Twelve, $192,800 to the public work reserve for stormwater. Thirteen, eleven thousand one hundred ninety-six dollars to the public works reserve for sidewalks. Fourteen, four thousand seven hundred fifty dollars to general reserves for Mount Hope paving. And fifteen, 
$4,604.38 to the Applefest Reserve. Is there any discussion? Councillor Tadman. Thank you, Mayor. I probably should direct this to the CAO um, after listening to um, uh, Mr. Puccini tonight, and he talked about the modernization reserve fund. I see we, the amount that we receive, we're putting in reserve. Could you let us all know what we're planning to do with that money? I think I can safely say we'll be talking about it at budget. Yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But do we have any special wishes? Maybe the CAO would like CAO. to. So, so, so the, the, through you, uh, Mr. Sure. Uh, the answer is absolutely. Uh, do we have a game plan? It's not, not definitive, but we certainly have a number of different ideas that we're going to bring forward for your consideration during the 2020 uh, budget deliberations. And, and I think it's safe to say, be, it being modernization funding, we can expect something around IT or or, or e-payments or things such like that. Or maybe modernizing the back of this building. <laughs> it's it's not a beautification, unfortunately. <clears throat> well, it would be nice to bring it up into this century, at least. I, we can probably find money somewhere else, but not through the modernization funding. <laughs> Any further? Oh, sorry, I did have uh, Councillor Rowley. Thank you, Mayor. Um, my, my concern is all of the money going into public works reserves. And I'm guessing that some of that is, I know we are, our department was fairly focused on flooding earlier this year and it kind of put everything in a backlog, that's for sure. But I just hope that some of these projects, although they're going in a reserve, will still be focused on for 20, uh, 2020. Um, I, and, and and I guess the concern, the real concern, if I may put words in your mouth, Council Rowley, might be we know there's a bunch of work that wasn't, didn't get done this year, and so that's why we're putting in a reserve. And how will we ensure, so I'm looking at both uh, Mr. Parkinson and Mr. Castleman, how will we ensure that that work gets done plus whatever 2020 work we, we think needs to be done? Um, and, and I'm looking to you to let us know that there is a game plan. There is a game plan. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> trust, trust me, trust me. <laughs> you have spoken about a game plan, and you do have something moving forward, and you'll be letting council know about that as we as we go through budget. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Council LeBlanc. Through you, Chair, uh, through CEO to to press the the uh, the three hundred twenty one thousand for engineering. Was that for engineering roads that the engineering contracts won't let, or why wasn't it spent? We we, we can do uh, three, Mr. Sure. Uh, we we can do a bit of a tag team here. Um, uh, certainly, there are three projects where uh, we uh, have, we myself have recently signed off of uh, as of uh, I think last week or in the last ten days or so, uh, whereby we're going to get on with uh, doing the uh, pre-engineering of three three projects, and I'll turn it over to Preston who can chat with with respect to what those projects are. Uh, thank you, CAO. Um, so we've uh, just awarded three different contracts. Uh, the first one being the design and reconstruction of uh, Sanford, Addison, and Napoleon Street, uh, Telephone Road, and uh, the industrial parks, so Loyalist Drive, Applewood Drive, and then Sharp Road and Sharp Road Extension. So uh, the work will be, the, all the award letters were just sent today to all the consultants. So work should be underway in the first uh, three months to award tenders by you know, the end of first quarter in 2020. You have a follow up? Yes, uh, through you Chair. The funds were lauded back in uh, February. Uh, for these pro for the for the stuff to do pre-engineered road, and uh, you have a project list that you wanted to award from. The also one more question I'll add to this: when I looked at the budget, there was also a building to be built at the uh, sewage treatment plant. I don't know if you built something else or you got something else to replace it, but I don't see that money that hasn't been spent either. Uh, yes, there was sixty thousand dollars allotted for a water and wastewater garage, but given our uh, priority is the MBBR plant and locating it and getting it built, uh, that's kind of fallen to the back burner until we get the the larger facility built. Then we know where our grounds are going to be located and where the space will be available. 
And as far as the, the money being awarded, yes, budget was approved and I believe May, but we didn't get staff on board till June, July, and then uh, we lost some capacities uh, with our construction side of things by moving a person over to the building to try to do some succession planning. Uh, so our construction technician just started today um, and we have our development tech up back on full time and also the manager of infrastructure in place so we'll be in much better shape uh, rolling into next year. Follow up? Yes, so if the 60000 wasn't spent from the building, it doesn't show up here in reserve, then it goes somewhere else. Director of Finance? Thank you. Uh, yes, so when it's wastewater or water, all surpluses and deficits are already um, by policy um, resolved through re their reserves. And so we don't do a carry forward because it'll automatically carry forward through the, the policy. Anything further? All those in favor? Are there any opposed? Motion's carried. Our next staff report is with regard to an accommodation study. Mr. Hagerman, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? No, I do not. Thank you. I have a motion moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Anderson. The council, council supports an accommodation study through the 2020 budget deliberations. Is there any discussion? Deputy Mayor. I just want to reiterate uh, how important it is and, and that there are possibilities, strong possibilities to fully fund the study. Um, I don't want to... I know we have to budget some money for it, even if we're going to get some funding, but I just want to make sure that that's going to be part of it. Maybe by budget that we have some ideas of that, I guess. So Mr. Hagerman, can you speak to that? Uh, yeah, just through some preliminary discussions, looking at some budgetary uh, numbers, um, we will have consulting fees for this project. Thank you, Councillor Tadman. Thank you, Mayor. My problem with this is that to um, I, I I expect the people that are going to uh, invest in our in our municipality or any municipality would do their own marketing, and anything that I've seen in the past, like with Tim Hortons, uh, Sobeys, No Frills, um, every everybody in McDonald's that have come here, they've done their own marketing. I have a hard time um, supporting something like this. Uh, Deputy Mayor says that we're almost going to get it for nothing. I'd like to see that um, before I would even vote for this. So I'll abstain at this time. So just for everybody's edification, this is just to forward this to budget deliberations, at which point we would see all the numbers, the in, the in and the out numbers, so that we could make an informed decision. Anything further? Councillor LeBlanc. Mr. Chair, just an explanation of what you said. So. If we vote on it tonight, you say yes, it's going to be deferred to budget. That's right. That's that's the intent here. Yes. Anything further? Councillor Bateman. Uh, once it gets set to budget, it might be uh, helpful if uh, we could have a copy of like a, a municipality that's done it before so we know what exactly the accommodation study will encompass. I did some research and I found one that was done out west and it's quite robust, the study. I'd be more willing to that people want to look because it tells you exactly what they're going to do from A to Z so you know what you're spending the taxpayers money on and I think we can probably find one more locally um, Coburg Port Hope area for example Councillor Anderson there's lots of studies available I saw them as well and they're they are local the people that will do it are local or are, are more or less local they're Toronto and uh, Ottawa and my, uh, I have num uh, numerous companies that do this not only is it a feasibility study, these people also put you or your municipality together with uh, company developers or companies that operate and develop uh, these facilities. So if we can get this done for nothing, so to speak, but we're, we're taking the proactive approach. Uh, a grocery store may, isn't the same as a hotel or an operation like that. Um, and chain operations, it's a business, yes. Chain operations work uh, as, as change too. Uh, but we're talking about a development of an accommodation facility, which may be a chain facility, uh, or it could be a private, a private operation. If we have the information readily available, it's like the old, and we need to, 
and hopefully we're and I think we are is looking at where could one be and that opens the door it's almost like a shovel ready situation where we're inviting them in and we're the ones that are prospecting to get that for our community to sit back and, and always wait it'll be just like maybe a Canadian tire that never came thank you councillor Anderson deputy mayor well I put it lightly deputy mayor um, because they did the marketing, sorry. The Deputy Mayor has the floor. Thank you. Black Air Industrial Park, which we spent money on in order to attract business, this is the same sort of situation. We need to create jobs and opportunities in this municipality. We hear about it all the time. We have so much housing going on and it's great but we need jobs we need opportunities we need places for people to make money we need areas ways to promote brighton and that's what this is about we spent a lot of money on the industrial park if we can get this for a relatively inexpensive cost it opens the door for this and this is what it is it's about opportunities thank you anything further deputy or pardon me um, councillor tadman I certainly would support anything that would bring more jobs to this municipality, but I also, uh, I think, my, I sort of have a common sense brain, as you may know or not know, but I look around and I think, well, who is going to use this hotel? We have nothing to offer in the winter time, except for parents that come for hockey, so that might be, how many times do we have a tournament? Um, in the summertime, the people that flood to this area, except for Applefest, are um, people that bring their own accommodations, whether it's an RV or whatever. So, um, and I know you're going to give me the argument, well, we have to find the need first, but I don't see the need. And so, uh, if you want to go ahead and call the vote, I will abstain at this time. Thank you, Councillor Tadman. And again, just a reminder, this is uh, forwarding it to budget for consideration where we would see both income and expense uh, opportunities for this kind of a study. But I will, before I call the vote, echo the Deputy Mayor's remarks. If if we're not in the, uh, in the job creation business um, by doing things like this, by supporting economic development with, with these kinds of studies, then from an ideological point of view, we should also consider whether we should be in the industrial park business because that is really what we're what we're talking about here is creating opportunities for job growth um, we're not buying a million dollars worth of land and and investing in it and and hooking it up to electricity which hopefully one day will happen in our industrial park um, but but spending what what appears to be in the neighborhood of twenty thousand dollars monies we can maybe find in a grant from a higher level of government uh, in order to uh, to bring jobs here but i i understand all the arguments i certainly understand councillor tadman's argument from an ideological point of view but i think we have uh, a greater social responsibility um, in terms of job attraction so i will call the vote all those in favor any opposed the motion's carried And our final staff report is the Economic Development Activity Report. And it's moved, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Hageman, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? No, I do not. Thank you, sir. I have a motion moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Anderson, that Council receive this report for information with respect to the Economic Development Activity for 2019, as well as a preview of 2020. Is there any discussion? Deputy Mayor. I just want to say thank you. Any further discussion? Councillor Rowley. Thank you as well. Um, lots in our industrial park. Uh, ben, do you have any idea how many we um, have left? Um, Depends on how you configure the industrial park. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Give a percentage of how many we have sold. Fairly, we would have about five, five lots left. Thank you. This is a good news story. Um, not just the the full report is a good news story, but the industrial park uh, specifically is a good news story. So keep up the good work. All those in favor? Any opposed? The motion's carried. And we'll move into notices of motion and motions. We have one notice of motion 
Moved by Councillor LeBlanc, seconded by Councillor Bateman, that Council requests staff to review and enforce the cannabis regulations within the municipality of Brighton, whereas any individuals growing, cultivating, and harvesting more than the limit of four plants per dwelling be required to operate under the municipal bylaw that states they be hooked up on town water and sewer. That will come forward in the January meeting as a motion. We have no unfinished business, so we move into bylaws. I have a motion moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Anderson, that Council gives a bylaw, its first, second, and third reading, and finally passes on this date, being a bylaw to designate a part of a municipal road as a community safety zone in Smithfield. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion's carried. I have a motion moved by Councillor Anderson, seconded by Councillor Bateman. The Council gives a bylaw, its first, second, and third reading, and finally passes on this date, being a bylaw to prescribe a rate of speed on specific municipal roads. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion's carried. And 12.4 is gone. I have a motion moved by Deputy Mayor Vink, seconded by Councillor Anderson, that Council gives a bylaw, its first, second, and third reading, and finally passes on this date, being a bylaw to authorize the Chief Administrative Officer to execute the appropriate documents and deeds to transfer title of municipally owned property being part of Lot 33 and 34, Concession B, being Lots 12, 13, and 14, Municipality of Brighton, to Kathy Cooney, QBT. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? The motion's carried. Did, did you include that in your report, Mr. Hagerman? There you go. <laughs> Moving on to reports of advisory committees of council, reports, minutes, and council reports. Accessibility Advisory Committee, moved by Councillor Tadman, seconded by Councillor Rowley. The Council supports the recommendation for the Accessibility Advisory Committee to approve a staff and committee training session. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? The motion's carried. Move on to reports and minutes of statutory committees, boards, and external agencies. I have a motion moved by Councillor Tadman, second by Councillor Rowley, that Council receive the Brighton Public Library Board October 30th, 2019 meeting minutes. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? The motion's carried. Moving into correspondence, direction items, endorsements, communications, and petitions. I have a motion moved by, our, sorry, our first uh, piece of correspondence is from the Brighton Kin, Kin Club. Is it still called the Kinsman? Yeah, Kinsman Club. And I have a motion moved by Councilor Tadman, seconded by Council Rowley, that Council support or, re or receive the request from the Kinsman Club of Brighton to proclaim the week of February 17th to 22nd, 2020 as Kin Week and February 20th, 2020 as Kin Day in Brighton and request flag raising of the Kin Canada flag on February 20th, 2020 at the municipal municipality of Brighton entrance. I assume we're supporting that. So the motion reads that we will support all of that. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion's carried. And from the Brian Todd Memorial Community Fund Board, motion moved by Councillor Tadman, seconded by Councillor Rowley, the Council received the correspondence from the Brian Todd Memorial Community Fund Board of Directors regarding the Butler Creek. Trail. Is there any discussion? Is there any response to that? Mr. Miller, should we be responding to this? Well, I, we can, but I, I know that I think the Brian Todd uh, committee is aware that there has been no new land. Um, purchases or any new land use agreements with any of the owners. 
So we're kind of at that point right now, or once we get something in opening, we'll, we'll definitely be uh, pursuing an, a new trail segment down there. Right. So w would it would it be appropriate to? I mean, we we say that they're aware of that, but they've sent us correspondence yeah. to suggest that they would like to have that in writing. I think so. Yes, I will uh, respond. Appreciate that, Councillor Tadman. Have we actively pursued um, the landowners again at this time? Because there's been a change in every one of those properties of ownership now. Well, one of the properties, of course, we're in an active dialogue with yeah. over a development, so that could And see. the other two, have we, um, have we approached them in any way? Mr. Miller? Uh, not directly, but in a planning process, they are aware of trail development and what we're looking for. Go ahead. May I suggest or recommend or whatever the word you like best um, that we should be approaching the other two so that maybe when this whole condominium whatever happens there uh, we'll have the three pack we could possibly have the three packages and move forward. I'm getting a head nod from the director, so that that will happen. And would that be con council's wishes that we? Um, ask the director to to speak with the landowners. Uh, we could we add, can add it. We to could the add motion. that to your motion. Go for it, please. Is that okay with you, Councillor Rowley, as a seconder? So what am I saying? And direct staff to contact other landowners with regard to the trail. Right. That's the connecting link there. Yep. So, and we've got the the next one up from there on the other side of Ontario Street, running up through the the other area and it's a nice little trail there so until we get that piece and then we can just do all kinds of things and keep moving go right up to the 401 and on and on and on dream in technicolor councillor tedman and direct staff to contact the connecting trail landowners is that yeah. a fair comment councillor leblanc uh, well i talked to a couple of the landowners but we'll go there but on phase one of uh the Philip development. There was supposed to be a connecting trail from uh, Proctor House going across to Highway 2, up to Highway 2. And I was wondering if that's been pursued to finish that one. Because now we're in phase two. What happened with phase one? I believe he's referring to Roslyn Estates. Roslyn Estates. No, it has not been pursued. Because I think, I think it would be valuable. It would be nice to try again. Yeah, like again, all the landowners are aware of what our trail plans are. There just has never been a an appetite to take us up on it. We're gonna we're gonna dip our toe in those waters again and see what happens. Councillor Tadman, we did have a committee trail committee, but that sort of went on the wayside in the last since the new election. Are we going to restart that committee so that? we can actively get this going again? I, I think we leave it with the director for now, and if uh, if the director feels that a committee would be helpful in any way, I'm sure he'll bring that back to council. Go ahead. Yeah, I fully agree a committee would be the way to go. It's just we, we need to get some new land or some opportunities in order to do something with it. Councilor Tadman? I just want everyone to know that if you do seek to get on that, to the director um, of Parks and Rex takes you in some pretty crazy places. The last time he took Daryl and I, and he lost, you lost your phone? <laughs> <laughs> Daryl lost a shoe climbing a fence. <laughs> It, it was it was quite a scene on a okay. very hot day. So we're going, we're going way offside here. <laughs> well, I just want to warn people that it's not the easiest job. There you go. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion is carried. We'll move into FYI correspondence. I have a motion moved by Councillor Rowley. What's fifteen point three? Oh, the one I asked to be put on. There you go. So 15.3 was put on your desks uh, this evening. It is a piece of correspondence from Mr. Fletcher uh, with regard to um, the hops kiln currently located at Memory Junction and the request 
that it be moved to uh, Codrington. Um, they, my understanding through this correspondence, and I'll ask the deputy mayor maybe to speak to this, is uh, that they have everything in place. They're not looking for any dollars or cents from the municipality, just permission to locate it on municipal lands in Codrington. Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you. Yes, um, I've had discussions about with Mr. Fletcher about this off and on. This barn was moved uh, from Smithfield uh, a number of years ago. It's not actually a barn, it's a kiln, I keep being reminded. Um, and uh, uh, it was moved because it was going to be demolished and it was moved to Memory Junction just because it needed a place to go. Um, it has nothing to do with Memory Junction or the Grand Trunk um, Station. Uh, the idea is to get it off of the property um, uh, before it's sold. Uh, he has a group of volunteers working with him to make this happen. Uh, it's not money that they're looking for. They're looking to move it to municipal property. Um, there may be some implications of that. Um, we probably need to maybe make sure that that's okay and maybe be, um, have staff let us know um, whether or not we can do that for sure. We can't just make that decision um, arbitrarily at this point. But um, So it'd be great if we could maybe just create a motion just to keep this going. The owners of the current property and the family have agreed to just donate the barn, um, the kiln, and, uh, and have it removed. So we just want to keep that ball rolling. I know we're talking about that property as well, but one doesn't have anything to do with the other. If that could be off of the property before there's a sale, it'd actually be better. Um, again, it has nothing to do with it, and uh, um, it'd be good for it to be moved to a place where it could actually be appreciated and used. Councilor Dadman. I remember the history of this and, and Basil donating it there because he hadn't, they wouldn't take it at Proctor at the time. And I think it, it definitely is worth, um, it's, it's, it's a heritage uh, I won't call it a barn either, but it, uh, I think uh, and and they have some great ideas to do with this. So uh, I think as long as we uh, make sure that staff knows exactly all the ins and outs of how um, they can direct Dennis Best to move it there um, the, to make us so we're not liable for anything. Councillor Rowley, just wondering, is there a motion uh, drafted already for this? I, I've just put some ink on a piece of paper and I'll read what I've got here. Certainly, like. I, would, I would certainly be a mover or a seconder of someone. And that council received the correspondence from Dennis Fletcher and further the council refer the matter to staff for, we don't really need a report, do we? For, disc, for what? CAO, what would you recommend here? Well, uh, through you, uh, obviously staff would have to uh, uh, take a look at the presentation, try and understand what implications, if any, whether it be from a liability perspective, risk perspective, financing perspective, it's certainly a new proposal coming forward to staff. We've done no research and really can't advise you at all with respect to the relative merits of the project. So I'm saying refer to staff for a report. So I've moved by Councillor Rowley as our seconder. Second by Councillor LeBlanc. Is there any discussion? Any further discussion? Go ahead. Maybe, Mayor, and I'm, this is just a suggestion that uh, the, the staff w on that motion uh, at least be in contact with um, uh, Mr. Fletcher because he's the one that's the mover, sort of, and shaker of this. So I would think that uh, he would be the most, uh, the one that would know exactly how to move forward, what he has as ideas to move forward. So. Sure, and that's, so we've received the correspondence from Dennis Fletcher and referred to staff, so they'll have that, yeah, okay. that contact info. Deputy Mayor? I just want to, we, you know, we have citizens in this community that are willing to do these things for us. And I know it's unusual and it's not really how we normally maybe do things, but I just hate to see this opportunity missed, that's all. Thank you, Councillor Rowley. There, there is no t time frame, though. We're not looking at a, a date as far as, I'm assuming it, it won't happen over winter, but um, I'm, I'm just not sure what, what, the, what the owners, if they have, if, do they want it off ASAP or is? My understanding is that there is an agreement between the current owner and, and Mr. Fletcher to donate it to somewhere, as long as there's no cost to them. That's my understanding. So I think I think there's I want to keep the momentum going on on that agreement. That's all, Councillor Anderson. 
Just to ask, uh, will we in this? Will we be taking ownership of it and responsibility for it? One presumes that if it lands on municipal property, well, that is the intent. Yeah, so that would be in the report too. The I think where, that's where you're talking liability and yeah. insurance and all these things. Okay. Anything further? All in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Now we move into FYI correspondence, and I have a motion moved by Councillor Rowley, seconded by Councillor Tadman, that Council receive the Northumberland County Food Policy Council update. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? The motion's carried. I have a motion moved by Councillor Rowley, seconded by Councillor Tadman, that Council receive the Northumberland County update November 28th, 2019. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? The motion's carried. And now we move into question period. If any member of the public has a question with anything that was on tonight's agenda, you may please approach. Go ahead. Please just push the purple button in front of you and introduce yourself for the record. I, I may have missed at the beginning when there was an amendments to the agenda. Uh, item 12.4, has that been deferred to next council meeting? 12.4 was simply removed from the agenda. Okay, so we don't know when it... Well, there were some, some concerns from our insurance company, so once those concerns are dealt with from a staffing level, it will it'll appear back on the agenda. All right, we'll keep our eyes open. Please do. Thank you. I would anticipate that those concerns could be dealt with in advance of next, of January's meeting. And there is only one council meeting in January. There's one regular council meeting and one planning meeting, so the regular council meeting. Any other questions from members of the public? Thank you. So we will take a 10 minute recess before proceeding in camera. All right, everyone, it's 8.38 p.m. I'll call the meeting back to order with a motion moved by Councillor Rowley, seconded by Councillor Blanc, the council resolve itself into closed session December 16, 2019 at 8.38 p.m. pursuant to the Ontario Municipal Act 2001 as amended subsection 239-2C, uh, proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land. Um, and we shouldn't we should name it we've been in trouble before remember in the land it does okay it's not on the motion that's all um, okay being a memory junction is there any discussion all in favor any opposed motions carried the council received the report for information and pre-approves a 2020 budget expenditure of $25,000 for due diligence on the memory junction property it's moved by deputy mayor Vink and seconded by councillor Rowley is there any further discussion all those in favor are there any opposed the motions carried I have a motion moved by Councillor Tadman, seconded by Councillor Rowley. The Council gives a bylaw. It's for second and third reading and finally passes on this date. Being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Corporation of the Municipality of Brighton Council meeting held on December 16th, 2019. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? The motion's carried. And finally, it's moved by... Councilor Bateman, seconded by Councilor Anderson, that the December 16, 2019 Council meeting adjourn at 9.01 p.m. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? The motion's carried. Merry Christmas.